Hey guys, back, uh, kind of picking up right. You can see the diagram right where we left off. And so we're going to do another 15 minutes, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of AP Chem. Hopefully things are going well. And I know the main thing <clears throat> I care about are jokes. So here we go. Uh, I'm looking here. What bone will a dog never eat? A trombone. That one was a little shaky. Okay, and the next one. What do you tell if you have? What can you tell if you have a dumb dog? It chases parked cars. Not the best jokes today. <clears throat> what should you do if your dog is missing? Check the lost and hound. Sorry, bad jokes today. Uh, okay, so we're going to pick up where we left off. So we were talking about solids, and we're ta talking about crystalline solids, ionic solids, molecular solids. So let me go back to this. I think this, again, I got this from uh, the, uh, the science teacher up in Bozeman, Montana, and I think he does a good job with this. So, so let me just review. So we talked about, okay, crystalline solids, the whole category, and then we had molecular solids. So these composed of molecules that composed of non-metals. They have a low melting point and boiling point. They're poor conductors. And examples of those are ice and sugar. And so you might want to note here, these are non-metals. So this is when we have two or more non-metals connected, okay? And then we have ionic solids. So we have uh, cations and anions. They have a high boiling point and melting point, so that tells me they're held together very strong. They're, as a solid, they don't conduct electricity because the ions are stuck in place. As a solution or melted, they are conductive because the ions are free to move around. They're brittle, and an example of that is salt. Salt is an example of that. Okay, so that's, I think, where we left off. So now they're, so going over here, and there's really, so under crystalline solids, there's a whole category which is called atomic solids. And in this atomic solids, so these are composed of just atoms. So we have network solids. We have metallic metals. And then we have group 18, which are no gases. Okay, so we're going to look at, at all these. So, again, kind of see, first of all, the heading, crystalline solids, molecular ionic, and then uh, atomic solids we really have. So we really have five kinds of crystalline solids. So these are held together by covalent bonds. And it's usually carbon, silicon, germanium. Those are the three elements involved in covalent network solids. They have a high boiling point and melting point. So that tells me they're held together very strong. They are non-conductors. And examples of these are diamond, graphite, SiO2, which is called quartz. Okay, so what you need to know about covalent network solids. Okay, metallic is that sea of electrons, that gel of electrons, that gel of negative that holds everything together. <clears throat> they have a variable... melting point, but usually higher. It's 
Some melt at a lower temperature than others. They are good conductors it's because of that sea of electrons. They're flexible because of that sea of electrons. And examples of these would be any, just any metal, so silver, copper, iron. Okay, and then the group 18, which are the noble gases, which really they're not solids. If we were to look over on the periodic table, they see them all in red. They are gases, but at really cold temperatures, they would uh, they become solid. So they're held together by LDF, a weak intermolecular force. So they have a low melting point. They have no conductivity. And examples, again, would be any of the noble gases, so argon and xenon. And, and I thought, again, that's why I wrote it down, because for me it was, it was a good overview of really what you need to know about solids. So if I just move this back for a second, you guys that care to can see the whole board and I'll just leave that there for a second. If you wanted to take a picture of that, you could get a good overview of. <clears throat> so everybody that got it can get a picture of that. Good overview of solids, which again, definitely will be represented on the quiz and the test that we will have in this chapter. So that it concludes solids. One other thing here is I wanted to, like I said, there's two big categories of solids. There's crystalline solids, which is behind me. But the other kind of solid is called an amorphous solid. And uh, I just wanted to talk about this briefly. And again, notice things you guys can be working on is you've got the Tinker Toy Lab. Here's a problem, 99 problems in chapter 10, your review from... Eight, nine, and now I have the quiz posted for chapter 10 and also the reviews. So those are things you guys can be working on. Uh, okay, and this is really kind of another for your information thing, but amorphous solids. Amorphous solids is, uh, they lack internal order. So crystalline structures or crystalline solids have organization within them, but not amorphous solids. Uh, and glass is the best example of that. I don't know if any of you have been walking along the beach on a warm day and you come across the uh, the people that are making uh, glass. You'd see they make it out of sand, just really warmed up sand. Quickly cooled quartz, very viscous liquid. So technically glass, what that means, very viscous. So that means it technically flows. And if you were to look in a really old home in the in the eastern United States or in Europe, you would see the bottom of the window pane, if it hasn't been changed, being thicker because the glass does flow. So technically glass is a liquid. Uh, to alter the properties of uh, glass, they add B2O3 and it contracts less when heated or cooled. It's called Pyrex. I have in my notes, Pyrex or Chymex have higher melting points, a greater ability to withstand temperature changes. So they're more durable. Like the glassware, the beakers we use in here and the flask, they're Pyrex or Chymex. Um, some of these are added to make glass much harder, the B2O3 and the uh, K2O. I have in my notes too, uh, just a couple other just kind of interesting things about like bulletproof glass, how that works. Bulletproof glass is glass <clears throat> plus a polycarbonate compound sandwiched between the layers of the glass. And the, the glass is literally like three inches thick. So there's there's glass and there's glass, and then there's these, this polycarbonate compound, which you can see through, and that's how bulletproof glass works. Um, adding cobalt oxide, cobalt two oxide makes deep blue colors of glass. Eighty or and adding PB, PBO lead two oxide 
makes lead crystal more reflective decorative glassware. So again, nothing, none of that is going to be on the test. That's just kind of for your information. Okay, and that's the way <clears throat> glass ceramics kind of looks. Okay, now, okay, going to want to get into this a little bit, and then uh, we'll be done. But vapor pressure. Vapor pressure uh, is... Uh, something that is one of the properties they always want us to predict. The vapor pressure is the pressure of a gas evaporated from a liquid or a solid. And, and the, the diagram there is good. And I, and I think I'm, I may start class on Tuesday showing you a short YouTube video just to give you a visual of what this is talking about. That's a good visual there on the bottom. But uh, equilibrium, so, so vapor pressure, note, is the pressure or is the property of a liquid which doesn't seem to make sense. You think vapor, you're talking about gases, but vapor pressure is the property of a liquid, and it's really a measure of how many molecules have evaporated above a liquid. Okay, and then on the B is a diagram at equilibrium, so we have as many molecules that are evaporating going from a liquid to a gas that are condensing going backwards. Okay, so vapor pressure of a gas is dependent upon temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the vapor pressure. And here's the kind of thing that in first year chem, I would explain, and I want my students to know, like I would you, what is vapor pressure? Vapor pressure is the property of a liquid. It's a property of a liquid. It's a measure of how many molecules evaporate above a liquid. So it's really, it's going to be about intermolecular force, and that's why we're doing it. And then I would expect in first year chem for them to predict, okay, as the temperature goes up, the vapor pressure goes up, okay? That's where I would end with that. I expect you to know that as well. What is vapor pressure? How are vapor pressure and temperature connected? But then I would go one more step <clears throat> with you, which I wouldn't do with them, and I want you to be able to explain why. Why as the temperature goes up, does the vapor pressure go up? And the explanation is kind of there on the right. As the temperature goes up, what does that mean? Well, that means molecules are moving faster. And that's what that illustration shows with the blue line and the red line and the black line. As the temperature goes up, molecules are moving faster. And if they're moving faster, they have a higher chance to break the intermolecular forces that are holding them together. And so as the temperature goes up, more liquid molecules are going to evaporate, and <clears throat> the vapor pressure is going to go up. Okay, let's do one more slide, and we'll call it a day. Okay, so vapor pressure is a function of the molecular weight and intermolecular force. So the... Uh, <clears throat> Inter, the intermolecular forces, so vapor pressure is a function of the molecular weight and intermolecular bonding. Low vapor pressure substances have high molecular weight and a strong intermolecular force. So what you've got here is we've got a lot of things where if the intermolecular force is high, the boiling point is high, the, the melting point is high, the uh, viscosity is high, but here it's opposite. With a higher intermolecular force, you have a lower vapor pressure. And if you think about that, okay, what does that mean? Well, that means fewer molecules are evaporating, which to me makes sense because, because not as many molecules are going to evaporate. Uh, so they're going to, they're going to, if, if molecules are holding tightly to each other, they're not going to be able to break away into the gas state. They're going to stay in the liquid, liquid state. And so if you look at the diagram on the, on the top right, so if we categorize these water, CH3OH, and then C2H5O into intermolecular forces, so water, of course, is hydrogen bonded. That's a strong intermolecular force. Now, C2H5OH also has a hydrogen bond. So I'm going to leave this on the board. But water has two hydrogen bonds, C2H5. OH is like this. And it's got H's around it, which means, yes, it has a hydrogen bond compared to water, but water has two hydrogen bonds where this 
only has one, and it's got these London dispersion forces. That means because this has two hydrogen bonds, this only has one, and this has a lot of other bonding, this is a stronger intermolecular force. And if you note the vapor pressure, not as many molecules are evaporating. And the other one, the uh, C2H52OH looks like this. It's called dimethyl ether. So this is the C2H5. 2, oh, it looks like this. So we got carbon, carbon, oxygen, carbon, and, and I'm going to do this again in class on Tuesday, but it looks like this. This does not have a hydrogen bond. This is called dimethyl ether. This just has, this is a dipole, which means of those three, this has the strongest intermolecular force, and if you look at the diagram there, it has the least amount of molecules evaporating. This would has one hydrogen bond, but not as strong as this. And then this is a dipole. And so it's not going to be held together uh, as strong. <clears throat> and so it's going to have a greater vapor pressure. So that's a good place to stop. And we'll revisit this point again on, um, on Tuesday. So hope you guys are doing well. And I'm not going to worry about this slide. This slide is something I'm going to tell you. We're just going to skip it. So, okay, guys, that's it. And I will see you guys on Tuesday.